All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. I'm your host, Cardin Ellis, with Cody the Oracle. Hey, everyone. How you doing? And today, we are going to... What are we going to talk about today, Cody? We seem passionate about this today. You you can launch us. Well, today, we're talking about the foreign policy first principle. I mean, we're really trying to go through all of Andrew Yang's policies, because quite frankly, he's got a ton of them. So we want to make sure you guys are just kind of aware of what it is he's actually proposing out there. And uh, one of the things he's proposing is his, of course, foreign policy, which did come a little bit late, but... Uh, in his own words, I always like to say, what is Andrew Yang actually proposing? Well, he says his goals are to make it harder for the United States to get involved in foreign engagements with no clear plan or goal. Love that. Rebuilding Sounds our- very America first, wouldn't that, you say? Well, I would even go beyond it being America first <laughs> to the point where it's, it's very much, um, it's just very, it's very much rational. It's just saying, why are we getting involved in, like, think about it. What's the point of getting involved in any kind of military capacity with no goal, okay. no plan? This like, is no the, one just gets involved and says, well, we'll hope for the best. Like, what is the point of this? This is the only thing I, I, I don't get. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a perpetual give him the benefit of the doubt kind of person, but I'm looking at Andrew Yang's policy proposal right here, and the policy literally is titled Foreign Policy First Principles. Now, I get some of that might be a reaction to pander the Democrats against America first. But are you really a candidate for the United States of America? I don't think it's pandering, dude. We've gone over this time and time again. I don't think it's but pandering. What, what I think it's just his opinion. But what does foreign policy first as a slogan really insinuate that you're going to put the interests of other countries and other citizens first? Uh, well, here, let's, let's go to as president, I will. Again, in the okay. man's own words, he says, as president, I will. Work with our allies to rebuild our stature in the world and strengthen alliances such as NATO. When it comes to people fearing us, I think our stature in the world is just fine. But it, again, this is a debate. Uh, reinvest in diplomacy and bolster funding to the State Department. Increase government spending is nothing I like to see ever, but whatever. Okay. Uh, work with allies to pro- project our combined strength toward throughout the world uh, without engaging in activities that will cost American lives and monies with no clear benefit to our long-term well-being. That I love. That I'm all for. Please stop getting us involved in these conflicts that have no benefit to the United States of America at any level and realistically are just going to cost us money. And when things cost us money, that money doesn't come from the sky. It comes from social programs. It comes from the social safety net. Okay. Inevitably. I mean, even if it comes from somewhere else, we have to move money around. You can't just spend $5 trillion fighting a war and expect none of that to come out of what our citizens need. And that's, I don't know, I'm pa- clearly passionate about that one yeah a sign in hey. sign a repeal to the U- AUMF for turning the authority to declare war to Congress and refuse mm. to engage in anything other than emergency military activity without the express consent of Congress uh, if he's talking about the provision that allows the United States president to I believe it's a couple hundred thousand troops they can move uh, it's the authorization for use of military force yeah um, which authorizes the United States armed forces against those responsible for that oh so interesting this was a 9/11 plan basically after 9 11 we said we need we congress takes too long we need to get people motivated quick and and you know which i don't like the idea of repealing this because i think it has a place yeah and 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 our system to a certain extent it is designed upon the separation of powers but it's not designed upon the stripping of powers and at some point we have to be able to trust our president if democrats trust barack obama to wield the power of the presidency correctly then he will win elections and we will entrust him with that power. But power is not power if it's not entrusted. And the AUMF is basically our people entrusting the president with the use of military force. Now, I think it should be limited. Well, I, it does have limits. I, I, I'm fine with trust but verify. But sign a repeal to the AUMF seems a little bit a, bit, a little bit big to me. Have you gone through all the points? Because I'd like to go through them one by one. Are you, have, have you finished the list yet? Um, last one, I believe. Oh, there's a couple. One, one of these is my favorite, man. Uh, he wants us to regularly audit the Department of Defense. Oh, That's, yeah. I love it. I love the idea. You know what? Oh, yeah. It reminds me, it reminds me of one of my favorite slogans of all time, which is audit the Fed. They'll never do it. I say the same thing with the DOD. They're gonna audit. You know what? Again, they audit the <laughs> DOD. They just move the funds elsewhere. Oh, you know what? Uh, NHS needs all of this money. Or, you know, all this. And by the way, he's going to audit the Department of Defense curb spending and then just spend the money on the state department like yeah. what, the, really the state department just sits on their hands all day like I, I anyway one last thing focus our federal budget on fixing problems at home instead of spending trillions of dollars abroad that one i love people that but it's give, totally america first it, it's a we've you know what this is like the fourth or fifth time we've gone through one of his policies and said donald trump said that in 2016 that's exactly what he said like word yeah. for word i mean i believe he went farther than trump on his border policy saying he's going to turn the rio grande to a moat yeah and you have to earn your citizenship <laughs> he went further so i mean like it's one of the things though i do like about andrew yang andrew yang and you accuse him of pandering all the time he doesn't pander 
He literally has a perspective and he defends it. Right or wrong, I don't agree with everything he's ever said, but he's totally willing to go out on a limb here, promote things that are very much tied to Trump, tried to modern conservatives, and say, look, I think it's still a good idea. Whoever came up with it, the notion that we're spending too much abroad and people are suffering in our country needlessly, that's not bipartisan. But you walk by, dude, just the other day, we live in Los Angeles here. I went to downtown Los Angeles. Okay. It's just misery. It's misery. It's filth. It's depressing. It is worse than Argentina. I lived for two years in a third world country, a supposed third world country. And let me tell you, any day of the week, I would take a homeless man situation in Buenos Aires over the homeless man situation in Los Angeles. Oh my God, dude. They're wanderers. There's lost wandering into traffic, begging for money. It's heartbreaking to see. I don't know how anyone can be a representative of the the Los Angeles local government and drive through that city without cowering and hiding because they realize I'm responsible for nothing but misery and filth. Anyway, though. All that aside, I do think that spending less overseas and more at home can maybe help that, but there's still more at play here. The government's failed so many ways. But anyway, just a quick synopsis. What he wants to do with foreign policy, he wants to strengthen our ties to our allies. He wants to spend a lot of money overseas in fighting wars. The biggest thing I think which should be common sense, we should not be getting involved in conflicts with no clear end goal. Like what's yeah. the how do we know when we're done? How do we know when we're done if there's no goal, no, no, plan, no reason for being You read being 1984, there. and one of the biggest definitions of one of these overbearing governments is the fact that they're always caught in endless war. Well, hey, so, really quickly, I don't want to cut you off. Speaking of endless war, uh, Andrew Yang went on Twitter recently to talk about the uh, brewing crisis with okay. Iran, I believe. And this is a quote from, Donald, from Andrew Yang. Uh, Escalating tensions with Iran are a massive move in the wrong direction. The American people have very low desire for another conflict in the region. I would re-enter the multilateral 2015 Iran agreement with the UK, France, and Russia, and Germany and pursue diplomatic uh, solutions. Uh, let reason prevail and let us avoid another chapter in our forever wars. So, I mean, like, the notion that we just get involved in these conflicts forever isn't lost on him either. Okay, yeah, but at the same token, this is what really bothers me about Democrats is I think it's noble to not want war, but they rebel against every single war and don't understand the principle of necessary force. I, my friends in the Marines have described it the best way I know. Sure, let's try and get their hearts and minds. That's what the diplomats do, is to try and win their hearts and minds. But if you can't win their hearts and minds, if you grab them by the balls, their hearts and minds come with the balls. Well, but dude, but also, right? I, I think war hawking's bipartisan. I don't think any party is owning war, but going to endless I, I don't wars. think it's necessarily war hawking. War hawking insinuates that you're, you've got an eagle eye looking for war. What, I just believe, what, like Teddy Roosevelt, I, no, I, what Teddy Roosevelt said, that you, you, you tread lightly, diplomacy, but carry a big stick. Well, no, military but, force. But but no, I, I agree with that. What I'm saying is we're not doing that. We're doing the opposite. Okay. So which let, is, for example, really quickly want to pull us up. And this is something that anyone has been closely monitoring the situation to be aware of. Okay. Um, the head of the Global Chemical Weapons Watchdog has ordered a probe into the leak of an internal paper which queried the body's finding into a 2018 attack in the Syrian town of Duma. Uh, Syria, if I pronounced that correctly, I'm sorry if I didn't. A Syrian and Russian media had seized the leak document written by a member of the Hog Base Organization for the prohibited, pro- Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which emerged on the internet in May. Uh, it goes on to say the director, Fernando Arias, said in remarks to member states made public on Wednesday that actions had to be taken following the leak. Um, and it keeps going, but I, I don't know if people are familiar with this. Um, in Syria, there's been multiple chemical weapons attacks from Barack, from Assad, the, the leader of the regime there. Bashar the lion. Which have been proven time and time again to just be false. They were done either by rebels or there was no chemical attack and it was a hoax. And, the, we now have and the UN report said so. International like, watchdogs are saying, hold on a minute. I mean, there's the famous photo, a famous bit of the CNN reporter sniffing the sarin gas backpack. Yeah. It's like, did you be dead? And if they knew that there was sarin gas there, they wouldn't even try it because they'd be dead. This is very deadly. So what I'm saying is the United States has no problem using subterfuge and using deception to start wars. I mean, just the other day, we were flying a drone in Iranian airspace right close to it in the, in the ocean, and they shot it down. And I ask you, if the Iranians are flying drones over the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of New York, would we just sit on our hands and say, well, you know, they're a sovereign nation, or would we shoot it down? I mean, we well, provoke have, and we edge and we hope for war more often than the opposite. Russians have skirted more than one or two of our battleships in the past decade, and they've flown into closer than airspace over Alaska than they should multiple times. Okay, but the... It, 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 I, Exactly. I, I don't exactly. slight. How many calls for war with Russia have you heard? I'm not slighting Iran for shooting down the unarmed drone, okay? Because, but we all know that when it comes to military intelligence, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. 
So, but my, we shouldn't be cheating in the interest of going to war. We should yes. be cheating in the interest of avoiding it at all costs. Well, I think you could say that surveillance is part of avoiding it. So here, let, let's go over. The, the purpose of this podcast is analyze Andrew Yang's foreign policy first principles uh, on his platform, and I want to give my take on on these on these few bullet points here. Uh, first, I hate the title. To me, the title does sound like the the progressive anti-American pandering. What does foreign first like? I, I'm sorry, foreign policy first mean you're gonna be helping other people's citizens over us? I don't know. I, I I don't have patience for that, but I give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. He says he wants to work with our allies and build our stature in the world to strengthen alliances such as NATO. Okay, one of the ways you strengthen the NATO alliance is by making them pay. I mean, one. I don't like the way Donald Trump talks, okay? I think, yeah, sometimes he says mean things. Yeah, sometimes he's vulgar and unrefined. But man, I felt it in my heart when he was talking uh, and was giving great examples of how NATO and many of our allied countries aren't paying their fair share. We're constantly worried about their fair share. And he gave the example of, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, you know, we, we lose three to five soldiers in Kuwait every year. And that may not seem like a big number next to the D-Day invasion, but that's three to five Dude, families. One's too many. One's yeah, too many. One's too many. And that's three to five families who have lost their loved one and whom they supported knowing they might lose him to go off and represent, quote, America and her interests. All right. But... I think that loss would just be a little bit more, not permissible, but a little bit more digestible if we knew Kuwait were at least paying for the protection. They're a small country. They can't defend themselves against Iraq and Afghanistan and the aggressions of Iran and so on and so forth through the Middle East. So they rely upon us for protection, but they're not even paying. Well, how so, about even if just there was a plan and a end date? Like, for example, when we entered the First and Second World Wars, that's one thing that I think soured Americans when it came to Korea and Vietnam. When we entered the First and Second World War, there was a clear-cut goal. Yeah, there, there was D-Day. We yeah. won. Well, not even D-Day, just a clear goal. Of no, like, I said V-Day, oh, Victory Day. Yeah, but like the Germans are trying to do something, we want to stop them. Same yeah. thing, World War One. the Prussians are trying to do something, we want to stop them. When you get to Korea and Vietnam and the wars overseas in the Middle East... Like we're fighting communism, yeah. we're defending American interests. What? When does the communism fight end? When does the fight for American interests stop? There's no date. You can go forever. Yeah. So until you include making NATO nations start to pay the one percent of their two percent of their GDP or whatever they agreed on on the NATO alliance, I, I don't take you seriously. Okay. I hate it when we give money to the UN just so they can have conferences about why America sucks so much. And then pay Saudi Arabia to be on the uh, not pay, but and yeah. then allow Saudi Arabia to sit on the human rights council. Yeah. Which, by the way, if you didn't know this, Saudi Arabia believes in public beheadings for breaking certain yeah. laws that they find a uh, very very uh, appre are very okay. um, important so, to them. So just keep that in mind. This is who's on the Another thing is Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you know this. Probably do. But a year ago, women finally got the right to drive. These oh, people yeah. sat on the Human Rights Council. Yeah. They didn't even want to drive. <laughs> this is crazy. And that's, I think that's one of the biggest things that I do agree with. I think this is a bit of failure of him. We might need to, you know, re rebuild our ties with our allies. But you know what? They got to do their they shit, They got to step up, They got to be hard on this stuff the way we are. You know what? Because maybe if the entire world said, sorry, Saudi Arabia, this isn't acceptable. I mean, a little side tangent, but recently the Worldwide Wrestling Entertainment, WWE, signed a massive deal with Saudi Arabia, yeah. went over there. Women wrestlers are huge in WWE. They weren't allowed to wrestle. The Saudi Arabia wouldn't let them. <laughs> so, like, the notion that the UN just allows these countries to do whatever they want and then says, well, but we're the arbiters of, of peace and justice in this world oh, is nonsense. Man. They allow people to get away with stuff they should not be getting away with ever they on a routine basis. They wouldn't let a lot of hot blondes run around in bikinis in Saudi Arabia Dude, wrestling each in, other? In 2019, women's wrestling is a real thing, man. They're, these could, it, There's some oh, depth issues, but they're joke. performers, man. They could wrestle. They could do their thing. Okay. And the Saudi Arabians said, sorry, women can't do that in our country. And the notion that they're just free to do whatever they want. Saudi Arabian prince owns like 30% of Twitter. Saudi Arabian prince owns parts of Disney. And it's just like, whatever, deal with it. When it's like, look, we don't have to go to war with Saudi Arabia, but we should be able to put our foot down and say, hey, look, man, we're not happy with how you do this, and we're not going to support you because you do this. Yeah. But uh, Are you suggesting that when there's red lines drawn that we and they're crossed, that we should do something about it? I don't think we should go to war with Saudi Arabia because they wouldn't let <laughs> Sasha Banks wrestle. <laughs> I don't think that's the way it should be. But I do think <laughs> we need to be a little bit of hard diplomatically and say, okay. hey, look, Crown Prince, we're not going to just bow over because you guys do have some issues in your country. I understand we can't just show up in Saudi Arabia and tell you to run the kingdom, but if you're going to be on the world stage, there's got to be some give and take. I, I think it's all take from Saudi Arabia, no give. Okay. 
So let's keep going here. Reinvest in diplomacy and bolster funding in the State Department. I'm sorry, this falls on deaf ears. The State Department had gotten so bloated that Donald Trump, Trump actually ran against it because it was one of the single most wasteful departments out there. And I'm a huge fan of diplomacy. I wish there was actually more Americans traveling abroad and going overseas and experience how the rest of the world lives and sees and so on and so forth, not just for the cultural enrichment, but also for the gratitude of what we have that's unique here in America. But the State Department has gotten way too huge. I don't want to return it to a wasteful and bloated level. Work with allies to project our combined strength throughout the world without engaging activities that will cost American lives and money with no clear benefit to our long-term well-being. Okay, that basically just sounds like America first. Sign repeal to the AUMF. Me and Cody talk about this already, but either you trust the president or you don't. Well, I, I think at its base, the AUMF, I, the way I understand that, that whatever they called it, is AUMF, is the idea that if we are to be attacked by terrorists yeah. and you can't declare war on Al-Qaeda, so we need to be able to mobilize our military to do something well, basically without used, declaring war through Congress. Used, I, I believe that. Yeah, it used to be that only Congress could declare war, but there was a 90-day limit to that in which the president could declare war because Congress was not in session. Well, he, he, could, move, he could move soldiers overseas in yeah. military capacity. He couldn't declare war, per se, but he could say, we're going to put boots on the ground the, in your the, country. This, this is something where I've already stated that I believe in the separation of powers, but not the stripping of powers. I don't want to strip the president or repeal the, uh, of his powers or repeal the AUMF, but I'm over okay with limiting power um regularly audit the department of defense yeah, say, say that without laughing man say it with a straight yeah. face you're gonna you're gonna re, you're gonna regularly ar- augment, uh audit the department of defense i can't even say that. i mean it, look a lot of this is like weight loss you know you can't tell a 450 pound obese person that i got a goal for you one month from now five minute mile okay not only is it just unfeasible but do you think all of those three letter organizations out there that have billions of dollars to do black ops are all of a sudden going to say, sure, audit us so you figure out where the money is. And by the way, a couple things that are not included in the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Homeland Security, Central Intelligence (laughs) Agency, Federal Bureau of Investigation, how much money is spent there? I remember Barack Obama learned the easy way. Why would I use the Department of Defense? I can have CIA black ops strikes in the Middle East on a daily basis. Oh, yeah. And it's a matter of national security. It's only not your business to know why we're in this country doing drone strikes. So it's still do it the same, man. Yeah, I am a huge fan of civilian oversight. But at the same time, you can't look at this goal as if we can't pull off Ron Paul's audit the Fed. All right. Audit the Fed. What? Yeah. What makes you think that we're going to be pulling off the Department of Defense audit? But anyway, finally, focus our federal budget on fixing problems at home instead of spending trillions of dollars abroad. He just went share on us. He literally just went share on us. She tweeted out and got lambasted for saying, hey, why are we accepting all of these, um, you know, migrant caravans? When we haven't even figured out how to take care of our own homeless. And she was she was just absolutely cooked in a pressure cooker for being so racist. But now I see, okay, fo- fo- focus our federal budget on fixing problems at home instead of spending trillions of dollars abroad. This sounds basically like a massive attempt at getting the America first crowd while promising to make government bigger again through uh, funding the State Department and its diplomacy. It it seems like you tried to get the American first crowd. Actually, I I don't want to assign him dirty motives, but I'm just saying this seems like 90% America first with sugarcoating on top that makes the leftists okay with it. And you want to hear something, again, going back to auditing the Department of Defense. I I have this graph in front of me. You don't, but I just want to ask you really quickly. Okay. How much do you think it costs the United States Department of Defense, right? Um, to buy one F-22 fighter jet uh, going off of 2009, 2017 oh, money. I would guess $150 million a plane. Oof, man. Yeah. Maybe maybe if you want a peasant version of it, if you want the commercial versions, $250 million. Oh, jeez. In, in 1998, we were paying $250 million so for So when one F-22. of those guys accidentally, you know, flies too low to the ground and has to eject and send that F-22 to the ground, he just ejected out of... 250 yeah. million. It reminds me, there's, there's a oh. book. They made a movie on it. It's called Starship Troopers. Uh, it's okay. kind of a funny story. The movie's kind of ironic and satirical, but the book's like 100% serious. It's, kind of, it's almost like a pro-fascist book. That aside, there's a bit at the beginning where the uh, one of the um, army commanders or 
corporals is speaking to like a private and he's just drilling in his head. He's like, you know how much those bullets cost? You know how much that firearm costs? That costs more than you. I'm more interested in that getting back alive than you are. I'm interested in you getting back alive. <laughs> and dude, yeah, you guys flying around in quarter billion dollar jets. Like it's like, hey man, you can't lose this. Okay, we need this back. It's a lot yeah. of money. So maybe we shouldn't be going to all these foreign wars. And yet so. you wonder, you go to a war, what are the odds that a couple of those get shot down? How many, like I said, if four F-22s get shot down, that's a billion dollars just gone. And, and Not you, to mention the fact that if, God forbid, someone died in those crashes, that's more money and resources gone from the Department of Defense. Yeah, and you can't look at what Utah did with their homeless population, just eliminating all of those bureaus and then finally just giving the people straight back. They're not thinking one F-22 less in a foreign war could literally feed millions. Anyway, please comment below. Let us know what you think. We appreciate your participation, your comments. Let us know if you have any videos and policy proposals you want us to cover. This is Problem Solver Politics.